Betuana land, a land of diverse beauty in her wildlife, cultures and people, with an amazing history, a story spanning thousands of years, and her people's journey through changing times, cultures, economic developments and challenges. Her national parks and reserves are incomparable to any other in the rest of the world unique in their ecosystems and pristine preservation and variation. From the sweepingly awe-inspiring reed beds of the Okavongo to the shimmering, forbidding sands of the Kalahari Desert, Botswana's faces are varied and beautiful. This is a young country, having only gained her independence in 1966. Covering an area slightly smaller than Texas, and with a population of around 1.7 million, she has come very far in a very short space of time. 10 kilometers of tarred road has increased to over 10,000, and with the strongest economy in the whole of Africa, her people benefit from a largely free education and healthcare system. Botswana may have one of the world's highest known rates of HIV AIDS infection, but also one of Africa's most progressive and comprehensive programs for dealing with the disease. The many socio-political changes of African nations reclaiming their power has always been a rather controversial process. Often, the welfare of the people involved is abandoned in pursuit of personal, political or economic gain, rather than looking at the issues at the heart of the matter, that is, the people involved. And this is where it seems Botswana sets herself apart. The eight major tribes residing in this land all seem to be at varying stages of development. The eastern parts are streaks ahead, having benefited from arable land, good rains and cattle farming, in addition to access to the railroad that brought the steam train carrying men and modernization to and from the mines in neighboring South Africa. The central and western parts are largely dry, desert and uninhabitable areas, but they are chasing hard, aided by the building of the Trans-Kalahari Highway, sweeping swift changes into the lives of the people. And it is here that we find one of the small groups of Pasawa, or San. And it is here that we find a culture that has existed longer than any other existing in modern day. A culture that is grappling with the move into current economic and political arenas, of which they have no real previous understanding or education. And it is here that we bring into play the very complex issue of preservation versus development. How does one preserve an ancient culture while trying to give access to the benefits of development? How do we bridge that delicate gap between preserving one's identity, one's dignity, 
and one's place in the modern world without being swallowed whole. This was our journey, seeking the answers to all of these questions. Yaruipe <laughs> <laughs> Ikoko <laughs> what surprises me is that long time ago before even the government dreamed of uh, relocating those people from one place to another my party took a position in their resettlement we regard them as our fellow countrymen whose rights are no different from ours as Bangladesh, Bakwena, etc., etc. But the only difference is that they have long been left behind in terms of civilization. We are miles and miles and miles ahead of them, not because they wanted the situation to be like that. The pre-colonial administration, that is during the time of chiefs, etc., etc., these people were regarded as his boys, his men, ourselves, etc., etc. In came the missionaries. They didn't press for their rights. Okay? Everything seemed normal. 
After the missionaries came, the, should I call them the colonial masters or whatever, the, 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 the British administration of say, Peter Fokas and The Honorable Malef Bangwe, an opposition him. MP, and this went on to tell me that it all started when these colonial masters demarcated the country into tribal reserves and state land. The Central Kalahari Game Reserve, or CKGR, fell into the category of state land, which was proclaimed in 1961 as a game reserve under the state. This was essentially a reserve with a dual purpose, an area for the preservation of wildlife and to allow around 2,000 San people living their traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle to remain. This situation was inherited by the new Botswana government when they gained their independence in 1966. Recognizing the need to protect this fragile ecosystem and its wildlife, the government introduced further policies to maintain the balance between nature and human development. In 1985, a survey and fact-finding mission raised issues about the conflict between the development of the people living in the reserve and the protection of the wildlife. Before this uh, relocation uh, decision was taken, a survey had been carried out in that area. And the results of that survey indicated that uh, that area was a, a poverty trap. Um, the main reason for the location was that government of Botswana has a responsibility and a duty to see to the development of its people. Consequently, they realized that the people inside the CKGR were scattered all over very small settlements in far apart, fairly space like that. And they were not really enjoying the fruits of independence. They were not getting the, the share of the national cake. As a result, government negotiated, consulted with these people and asked them to find a place of their choice where they could settle together so they could be provided with all the necessary facilities or amenities like schools, clinics, portable water. We say that our fellow countrymen are entitled to whatever we benefit from our independence, our development, etc., etc. Hence, there is need for them to be resettled. We are talking about build them, building them some schools, industries, clinics, roads, mention it. Anything that is found in contemporary civilization, we feel they are entitled to that. Hence, the need to develop them, the need to build them clinics, schools, etc., etc. In this country, the rate of literacy at the moment is around 90%, uh, particularly between the, uh, the, the age cohort of 19 and, and 49. It's about 90%. And in other, overall, it's about, uh, you know, 87%. And uh, in this area, uh, the rate of illiteracy was exactly the reverse. And we felt, you know, how do you allow people to live in an environment like this? Um, you know that the CKGR was uh, established as a, a game reserve in 61. And at the time, it was allowed for humans who were hunter-gatherers to live within the park because they, they were not consuming more than they could handle. With the passage of time and developments which are affecting each and every one of us, the lifestyles of people that are residing within the, the CKGR changed. They increasingly got involved in uh, agricultural activities, ranging from both arable uh, farming, where you see lands with crops, to rearing of livestock, cattle, horses, donkeys, the whole works. And that started to pose a problem, really, uh, from a wildlife point of view, because now um, issues of diseases came into play, issues of um, overgrazing, although localized as it was, it was not a sightly thing to have within a, a, a protected area, a game reserve or a national park. They were now rearing wild um, livestock. They were ploughing. They were becoming more. They were not no longer hunter gatherers. Obviously, this then became a little bit of a problem because, secondly, the Wildlife and National Parks Act prohibits any consumptive use, uh, commercial use, 
of um, the wildlife. So what was becoming very clear is that this has also started to become a business where they would kill more than they could because if you hunt on horseback, you can kill more than you can really consume. And people, it tended to be people from outside the reserve were coming in to come and buy the meat. And therefore, this was an economic activity, which according to the Wildlife and National Park Act, is not allowed within the reserve. Enter Kuela Kiyama, a sand from the Western Khansi area, a wonderful musician, our guide and interpreter. He was one of the first to relocate in 1997, 12 years after the initial fact-finding mission. I was born in Kwai. Kwai is our tribal land in CKJ. We moved to Kaidi where there was water and there was a borehole in mid 1970s. And in 1997, the government relocated us from from the Central Kara Game Reserve and to new settlement called New Kaidi. Now, Kuela is a man who represents the struggle of one trying to preserve what he calls his living history. And his story to date is testament to that. He started school at 15, the age of a man mature enough to marry in San culture. He was already a skilled hunter with an intimate knowledge of the laws and fruits of the bush. And he was the first San in the whole area to finish junior secondary school and went on to complete a university degree. It wasn't easy. He told of his initial struggle with the language he was taught in and the obvious cultural differences between himself and fellow Tswana speaking classmates that often resulted in fights and various forms of persecution. This seems to have been a common experience for many of his community. So why did he think the relocations took place? The reasons are many. Always about tribalism because the, the government of Botswana never recognized Basara or the San people as uh, human beings who are to be respected and who, who are entitled to their tribal land. Mm -hmm. So they just see us as a, an enemy to the, to the environment that we live in, not people who are supposed to be included and hold government development programs and mm -hmm. who need to be respected and be taken care of or be given responsibility also to, to look after the environment and so on. Some of us, we starting to kill more animals than we needed. Mm -hmm. And we have moved from the traditional way of life into a more of a commercialized uh, killing of animals. We spoke about the importance of land to the San and how that would affect people and what the best way to deal with this push towards modernization would be. Human, human beings all over the world have emotional attachment to the land that they are familiar with. They are spiritually linked to their land. Mm. And they, their norms, values, and customs are rooted in their traditional land. And the, the land is their mirror. They, it, it reflects their image. And they are proud of their land. That's why, and, 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 and they have that psychological strength that makes them human beings of a certain geographical area. Relocation to me is like I might call it transplant, transplanting. You uproot people. You cut off them from their land, from their roots. You take them out of the land where they have been strong and um, rooted and transplant them into a new land. They can wither because they must be spiritually strong. The land, their traditional land, was uh, sort of a he was given a spiritual nourishment to them. So now they come into a land that does not reflect them. The land that does, does not carry their history. The land does not reflect them, their, their image. The land does, does not hold their norms and values and so on. So they are people of no norms and values. Mm -hmm. So modern type of life has nothing to do with living a resource-rich land to a barren land. It does not mean to remove people from the resources, to replace them somewhere where they will end up being dependent on government handout. That's not modernization. I don't think it's, a, it's a modernization. Modernization is only changing the mode of production and consumption. 
-hmm. within the same environment, using the same resources within which you, with, with which you have been surviving. The resettlement villages of Kaudwani and Nyutkari we found to be modern villages with schools, clinics, agricultural projects and a few other development projects having been set up to aid the people in their move towards modernization. The biggest issue seemed centered around the fact that people simply did not have the knowledge or experience to understand and grasp the access to development that was being afforded to them. People had been compensated with goats and cattle for their move, houses had been built for them, but many of them did not really understand or appreciate this gesture. And as we went around talking to the people, it became clear that underneath the modern facade of the surroundings we found ourselves in was a simple culture, not yet able to really engage with the opportunities being offered. Alcoholism was an issue, with boredom and lack of employment due to no education being a major cause. Confusion, conflicting opinions, and a real sense of just not understanding the relocation was evident. Make no mistake, many were really happy Glad for the fact that their children could get an education and access to modern health care. Glad for the opportunity to share in the national cake. While others were simply lost, missing their land and their life. And then there were so many differing opinions as to what the people actually wanted and the practicality of being able to give it to them. The younger generation generally wanted to stay and the older people to go home. They wanted access to education and clinics, but inside the game reserve. They wanted to be able to move freely back and forth, but with their livestock. Now how do you allow that in a game reserve, and keep everyone happy? They have won their case. They can go back. Back to a way of life that perhaps is no longer viable, no longer survivable, due to the changes that they themselves have undergone. I just want to say that there's a real human tragedy behind this whole thing, and, and it's not really about the law and what's happening in the court. And if you go to the uh, resettlement camp, you see people sitting around there, they have lost 10,000 years of history. So it's not a question of are they living in a house and are they fine and what, what is the law. It's a human, it's an unspeakable human tragedy of people who will never ever re regain those roots. Uh, they're not traditional anymore because of external influence, because of the westernization. But they're not westernized totally. And in that itself, there's a lot of problems. Because they cannot hunt and gather as free, freely as what they did 100 years ago. And there's no employment for them. There's a lot of other associated problems. So what would be the best practical solution to solve such a dilemma? This is where the negotiation involving the San and the government in the form of the third draft land management plan could be a possible way forward. The third management plan which is often cited is the one that has now become a public document even though it is still in draft form because of the, the ongoing case between Basawa and government. And um, the plan differs from our other protected area management plans in the sense that it uh, recognized uh, the need to provide access to communities around the CKGR to harvest uh, veil products and engage in ecotourism within the CKGR. Tourism is the second largest um, source of income in Botswana after uh -huh. diamonds. And that would mean that the more benefit could come to the San people if, if their traditional knowledge about hunting, about animal myth, mythology and uh, tracking skills and other things um, could be put into, to use to use for the benefit of the Sun people mm -hmm. and make them um, people who will be responsible for the environment. Mm -hmm. Look after the environment, look after these animals, use their culture to, to attract the tourists and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It will be, I think, a, benefit, a good thing for the country, in particular the Sun people. Yeah,
These discussions and negotiations resulted in the fourth draft of the plan, which was due to be implemented. This process was halted, however, when local NGO, First People of the Kalahari, led by Roy Sasana, took the Botswana government to court to win back their land. They enlisted the help of overseas NGO, Survival International, for support. This resulted in the international spotlight being turned onto the relocation issue, and somewhat sensationalist claims of genocide were made, and blood diamonds or conflict diamonds were being touted as the main reason for relocation. To put things into perspective, genocide means violent extermination of an entire race. In Botswana, we're talking about a living population of around 55,000 Basawa, many of whom chose to relocate and now live in integrated communities all over the country. Approximately 1,000 were affected by the relocation and about 200 chose to take their case to court. Conflict diamonds are diamonds that originate from areas in the throes of civil wars and are used to fund aggressive military action to oppose and overthrow governments. The paradoxical fact is that there has never been any war in Botswana and that they were the first to put the Kimberley process in place, a system to identify and monitor the ethical origins of diamonds. And above all, diamonds in Botswana are the very foundation on which development for all her people has been built. I see diamonds as being very, very positive in the country in the sense that I'm an example, I personally am an example of what those diamonds do. Those diamonds educate you. We get free education in Botswana. Those diamonds feed us. They, they, they keep us healthy. We've got free medical facilities in Botswana. Those diamonds are actually trying to promote. Right now, like I say, HIV AIDS is very high in Botswana. People are getting free medication. medication. Those diamonds are what is helping, what is making the government afford that medication for its people. There are several companies with licenses to prospect for minerals throughout Botswana. The diamond-bearing stone, Kimberlite, was found in the Hopa area of the CKGR, but a feasibility study indicated that mining operations were just not economically viable, and no mining has actually taken place in the CKGR. So how would the sand feel about mining operations in their land? Definitely there are some stones underground. Mm -hmm. So, let's then say diamonds are there for, for Botswana, all Botswana, to work in, in the, in the mining company um, um, operations. And go and work as miners, mine workers. Uh -huh. The sun uh, should not be excluded from such kind of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they should, mm -hmm. the government could have opened mining operations in Hope eh, and hired some people. I, I should say maybe 20% of the mine workers could be uh, the sun people of Sikhaja. That's a benefit from them. Debswana, the company, was formed with a 50-50 partnership between the Botswana government and De Beers. People relocated freely when the diamonds were discovered in the two major mines, Joineng and Orapa. The operations have attracted more settlement, with the communities gravitating towards the visible socio-economic benefits available through the diamond mining operations. We've been uh, instrumental or part of the uh, success story of Botswana's economy. Uh, as we contribute in the region of 30% of the GDP and uh, over 70% of uh, foreign uh, income. 
that uh, that uh, Botswana gets, uh, calcium diamonds. Success story really is about two things. One is the good fortune to have found diamonds in Botswana, but also the good governance to have had uh, people or leaders that have been able to use those diamonds to good effect. Well, the, the actual pipe or hole where the diamonds come from is about, say, 100 hectares of that order of size. And um, joining is about half that size. So the total lease area, which is the area that has been fenced off to, um, to, to support the mining operations, is about 13,000 um, hectares. Okay. So it's a, it's a relatively small area in the bigger scheme. The environment is a, is a significant um, issue for us as, as a mining company. We know that mining does have an impact on the environment, but um, we have been uh, trailblazing in terms of how we approach uh, managing the environment. Uh, Debswana as a whole was the first company in the country to be certified ISO 14001 uh, compliant. That means we have systems in place, we have people employed to do nothing else but uh, put together programs for ensuring that our impact on the environment is as minimal as we can get it to be. And it's certainly world class in the way that it is practiced. Other things that we've assisted with include the SOS Children's Home for orphans here in Habron. Of course, the HIV AIDS scourge has led to a lot of orphanage, orphans uh, in the country. So it's our little contribution towards that big issue, uh, quite apart from, uh, from assisting our own employees with uh, antiretrovirals on, on HIV. Uh, a number of other things have taken place. There's been farming projects, guinea fowl projects around our mines, uh, game parks, etc., that we've assisted with, uh, and NGOs. NGOs are an important part, really, for sustainability of any country. Uh, they're another force to make sure democracy remains. And I think our government and companies like ourselves want to support NGOs for the purpose of civil society. The key thing as well for us is that we, we need to be able to assist communities within which we operate. Uh, for our own sustainability in the long term. So we try to do some things directly with the communities involved. One of the projects uh, that we do, that we have done, or have put money aside for, is a Tsudilo tourism project with the Kuru community um, to develop uh, uh, activities around the Tsudilo Hills area. Uh, to this we've uh, agreed a number of 3.7 million pula towards that project. Tsudilo Hills, a World Heritage Site is an enigmatic place of great significance for the sand. We believe it to be the site of first creation. These hills, known simply as the grandfather, grandmother, and the grandchild, represent the spiritual home of the people, and it boasts the richest natural gallery of Bushman paintings in the world, with over three and a half thousand rock paintings adorning the stone faces. An exciting land use management plan is in the process of development, hopefully to be approved by government and then implemented and it is at the cutting edge of win-win land management, as it will involve the government, communities, and the private sector co-managing and co-benefiting from a site of touristic, cultural, and conservation significance. Number seven, or oh, one number and number seven. Gonna go on a Renate. Yanonary Rena Lima Sarrela, Osinava Tovas, Tuana, Osinava Tova Makua. Osinati Tila Zericula is out to Kubushaga or Tawano. The Polo Lodi Demon or you two to Ali Po Nines Gihulanyan and Nanagar Hitel, Kitty Bon. Yanon Hosham in a rejoicing, the no sinners, correlates in Osina, my position, no sinner, my game about Sarava. Bonta de Navabola, the Polo, Locadio Hoyle, the Mechu, the High, a two mighty notes, a Rija, Osina, Nani, the Jota Mongongo, Mukumpa, Monsunsunya, a rejoicing, the Otamala Rena, 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 but to one Tao who read the like Makoa. The 
Kunzaikao is just one of the Sun people in this community who is benefiting from the Tsutilo Hills project. The project is being coordinated by Tokadi, one of Botswana's local NGOs. We spoke to the coordinator, Kabo, and one of his project assistants, Nisa, to find out more about how Tokadi is working with the community. Well, basically, uh, our program started in uh, 1998 as the Guru Development Trust and Gamelian Project. And then uh, in 2001, when uh, it was unbundled, it became Trust for Kavango Cultural and Development Initiatives, which is Tokadi. And we are currently working with about six uh, community-based organizations or trusts. Uh, one of them is Tzodilo Community Development Trust. He explained that Tokadi understood that communities were not homogenous and that each needed an individual approach and support system. To that end, initially they would go into communities to talk and listen to the various requests of the people and then help them to plan, implement and monitor their own development programs. The paradigm of helping people to help themselves. Later on, the private sector got involved, mainly Debswana and De Beers from the funding side, and presently the government, the private sector and Tokadi are all working together to support the development of the community. The reason why I came to Tokadi was that I heard that Tokadi was working with the the same people who are so marginalized to help them to uplift their, their lives. And so I was so interested because Tokaji was working with my, my community, my own people. So that's why I decided to, to work for Tokaji, to work for my people. So we don't do everything for them. We listen attentively. We, we come to them, we, we sit with them and listen to them, and we don't make decisions. We just help them and they, they are the ones who make decisions. Mm -hmm. We have done the, the mapping, we mapped some areas. We just took one person from the Hamburgushu and one from the Juntwas, and then went with them around this area, mapping the important places. So this mapping was also included in the management plan. 
Well, the, the, the management plan basically uh, tries to uh, make sure that the community benefits from the overall management and uh, utilization of Zodilo Hills as a tourist attraction area. The general idea is that communities will make an income out of tourism. They would be involved in the conservation of the resources in the form of the paintings and the wildlife in the area. And the plan looks at increasing cultural activities, allowing communities to tap into their culture and make money from it. I think uh, this will be a role model for uh, other uh, feature plans, that uh, there should be uh, a win-win situation between different stakeholders and they should treat each other with respect because uh, here we had the museum that listened to the communities and the community listening to the museum and um, uh, probably in the CKGR uh, the third management plan will be uh, the way forward because then if it comes up is something that uh, the community was involved in um, something that they will participate in is something that they will um, uh, identify with since uh, they are part of it. I think it will be a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tokadi is just one of eight NGOs under the umbrella of the Kuru family of organizations that are working with various San groups around Botswana. They have the common goal of involving San communities in actively participating in their own empowerment and development and helping them to take control over their own destinies with a holistic approach. They have done extensive land mapping exercises with various groups, which has revealed fascinating information about the people's intimate knowledge of the land and the resources on it. This has the potential to benefit both the people and the country for conservation and eco-touristic purposes. One such project is the Tlankari Game Farm. Our aim at Tlankari is to generate funds number one, for the community of Dekar, because the land belongs to the community of Dekar. They've got title deeds on the land, and that's one of the reasons for this place, to preserve the culture, to generate income for the community, and employment. Uh, we're doing that by income generating projects like uh, the tourism and promoting the, the culture with bushwalks. They, they take the people out in the, in the felt. They teach their, their children about the, the bush and about the felt, the felt foods, the medicinal plants, uh, the spores, the birds, the animals, while they go out on the bushwalks. The dancing like you saw last night, where the youngsters is coming in again and trying to, to learn. And that is... I think uh, very important. The people, the sand people, Bushman people, as you want to call them, never had a traditional leader. They had prominent people, they had all those type of things, but never one fixed leader. They never had ownership, they never had a business. Owner. So to combine all of that into a modern profit generating business is a big paradigm shift that needs to take place. I think number one training in the, in the uh, educational is, a, is the most important. Uh, you cannot take somebody out of the felt and put him in as a manager or into a business without giving him all the necessary tools that he needs, without giving him the knowledge to compete with somebody that's been in business for 200 years. So build the capacity within the, the limits of the where they are developed at that stage. It doesn't help to, to overdevelop too quickly because then you create unfair expectations again and then it became a gimme, 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 gimme situation. We need to preserve the culture of these people. Number one, because it is important for them, 
it's important for the community, it's important for the world. If we don't do it, and there's too much pressure from the Western world, uh, the culture will die. The small town of Dierkar is home to a number of projects under the Kuru family, including a museum, craft shop, art and language projects, and a cultural centre where various community workshops are run. Originally a mission outpost of the Reformed Church of Botswana, they are active in many areas, including the documenting and disseminating of indigenous knowledge and the oral history of the people. This is extremely important in preserving their identity and pride as a people, involving both the younger and elder generations. Now their work seems to be a good example of how other sand groups have been able to embrace change. Out of the mission station, or this mission farm or whatever, basically people came here to squat. So there was a whole lot of people just squatting here. They didn't have anything to do, they're not getting any support, they're just sitting here helpless. And So that, that's why the church started to, to, to find something to help them. And the only way they could try to do is to help them to help themselves. And that's what the word kuru means as well. It's a sun word meaning to do yourself, to help yourself. And, and that's why we started. What we can do is just keep on trying to preserve their culture and their language. And then hopefully through education and everything else, people will come up, come up on top, I suppose, I hope. Kuka is a Naro San, an employee of the Cultural Centre. And not only is she helping herself, but she's helping her community through her work with Kuru. My name is Koka Christian. I'm working with the Guru Cultural Center as the assistant. And the cultural center is important to us because we are traveling around this country district, this Bujwana, and teaching people about the sun people and their dances and their stories. And this center here is trying to help people to think about their, to remember about their culture and their, their old traditional way of living. There has been an issue with the San losing pride and ownership of their culture and language, and much is being done by this NGO to help restore this in these people. Included in these efforts is the annual Kuru Dance Festival, involving tribes from all around Botswana and neighbouring South Africa and Namibia. It is a celebration, honouring their traditions and healing rituals through an important part of their cultural identity, dance. You know, yesterday, last night, there was a healing dance at in someone's house and see how far I stay. But when my husband heard that and he phoned me, we went there. We went there at 10 o'clock, but we came back at 2 o'clock in the morning and it was so nice to hear the, the, the healing dance and share it with the others. It was very nice. I came late home. My mother asked me, why are you people coming so late? I said, we had the healing dance. She said, you, you like healing dances? I said, yes, because you gave it to me. I said to her this morning that she is the one who gave me that. That's why I love my culture. And I'm, I'm proud of my culture. Dishwanello is Botswana's human rights and advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring the voices of the marginalized are heard. And they were behind First People of the Kalahari's initial move to take the government to court. They are part of the coalition of local NGOs whose sole intention is to focus on the support and development paradigms for the SAN by representing and advocating their voices to the government. In terms of the questions that we set out to answer, perhaps they present a practical solution. We remain committed to honestly believing that the only way to solve this situation is to sit down and talk. Um, as I've often said to people, even South Africa, after years of bloodshed and apartheid and loss of life and all sorts of things, eventually sat down and talked. And do we have to wait until there's been a lot of damage before we see sense and realise that we need to sit down and talk? Courts are very limited in terms of what they can and cannot do. And the court is not really the right forum to deal with development issues. Um, they don't determine the budget. Um, they don't determine um, policies. Um, they can only realize what the law has legislated. Um, I think for us, human rights is premised on the whole notion of dignity. 
and what has really been missing in all this, this, these exchanges has been the notion of dignity and respecting each other um, and providing space to seriously listen to one another. And that is one of the things which has frustrated us in, immensely um, working in Botswana, um, where the slanging match which happens means that with all that happening, there is no space to be quiet and to truly um, call our government to the table to have a sit down around the table as concerned citizens of this country um, to find a sustainable solution um, to what has become a much bigger problem um, than it, it needed to have become. Voices of the Sands of Botswana are many. Each has a different plea and tale to tell. And as with any country moving into the modern world, will have her issues along the way. Theirs is a future waiting to be penned, with a hand educated in understanding the ways of this new world, and thus being able to feel and be a part of it, and actively participate in directing their growth and development through open, honest dialogue. Dialogue to facilitate a common goal, and negotiation to help preserve a culture in the face of inevitable change. Not a culture to be preserved in a glass box, but rather as one that is living and breathing, one that is acknowledged and respected and able to adapt and grow. And so ends the beginning of a story yet to be told.